I'm going to put over there talk about enough is the trauma of children of incarcerated parents. There are yes. 83,000 kids in the state of Pennsylvania whose families are incarcerated. That's right. And that trauma is not just the shame of having a parent behind bars, but also the lack of having a father in the home. Yes. A, a yes. mother who's doing life. Yes. What can be done for those children because so many times their yes. behavioral problems, yes. their acting out, and the economic poverty of having only one parent. Mm -hmm. And as, as Dr. Flynn said, if we gotta have little group learn this stuff, so you can come out and teach it, and in them schools, right? We, I'm, I work in a school, I'm an athletic director at a high school, and I'm a social service liaison. So two of my colleagues are right here, they came on their own. She's a counselor, she's an educator. We have lost three kids since school started and two shot. So it, it traumatized our community. So we working and still healing, but when you do this type of work, you can heal and, and it gives resilience to our children because they see we loving them, we working them through it, but the more information we can get to better do it, we have to keep sharing it, coming to homes like this. And I'm so glad that the churches and the, the faith thing is really not the one going now helping instead of outside organizations or whatever, we can organize here and make a difference. So I just want y'all to know that whatever you want to do, this is the climate and the time that we can change. Yes. So let's get all this information we can. Let's use, we're not here to tell you about joining the OACP. Just be active. Yeah. You know what I mean? Dr. Flynn has been a champion. You know, she's our president, second time being elected just a month ago, a few months ago, but she had a pulse of this 12 years ago. You know, when nobody was listening, she was still knocking on them senator doors, the administrative doors, and she has done a good job around education. She knows this thing. We just need to ride this train now. Yes. Anybody else want to be on it? Yes. Because we get ready to be victorious. And if we do it, things like this, we got to do it in three spots. We got to do it educationally wise, keeping our kids out of there. We got to knock that criminal justice system down. And, and then in closing, four years ago, we got a great uh, commissioner of prison. He did a test on incarcerated men and women. 95% of them suffered trauma, whether physical abuse or sexual abuse. And it was more higher with males being sexual abuse yes. that caused yes. anger yes. and created what we see. Yes. So trauma Nobody talks about is a big part of what's going on in society that we don't see. Mm -hmm. So this type of education, to fight what we need to fight, we can be victorious. I'm just like really optimistic because 20 years ago, we would get five people in this room when you're talking about criminal and justice reform. You know, so we, we on the battlefield. We started in 97, winning in Pennsylvania. Now we can vote. Soon a person get released from prison, they are allowed to vote. Before it used to be, you had to wait five years. We sued in 1997 and we won. They tried to repeal it a few years back and we knocked it down again. So it's good. Children love you one another. The issue of mass incarceration, the issue of education, and the fact that in many of our schools our, our children are getting a less than full quality education because of lack of funding and other lack of resources, and the trauma that is often experienced in both those contexts because of inadequate resources and just the way the system is set up. And our speaker tonight is uh, Reverend Joanne Duval Flynn. She is the president of the NAACP for Pennsylvania, and she's going to be talking to us about a trauma informed uh, understanding of the school. Neglect and maltreatment, sexual abuse, you, you can see them. And here is something if, if the community is chaotic, 
Okay. Um, let's look at the next one. I want to point out something. See, sometimes we don't realize how many people have come to this country and the children have never known anything but war. I've had students in my own career. I remember one young girl when, when I taught sixth grade. And she was off the ground. And her grades were just awful. So her mother came in for conference and she said, I don't know what's wrong. She was an A student at home. Well, the child had come out of war. She had come out of a culture she was familiar with and her native tongue. She had come into a different social context where everyone was a stranger, the culture was strange to her, and she was traumatized. Trauma is a medical condition. It is physiological and psychological and emotional. And so, um, until school realizes that these are the children of 2017, 2018, and the future, we're not going to be able to deal with them appropriately with the same human regard and respect they're due to. And we do put them into a disciplinary mode and suspension and expulsion. And I learned years ago when I first started working on this that some school districts, if a child had been expelled, when they, they would have to, or no, if they had been to juvenile detention, when they came back, they had to wait six weeks before the school would register them. You know, I'm thinking, what law are they following? You know, how are they getting away with this stuff? And what's a kid who's just, who, who has been expelled from society, sent back without any re-entry kind of steps. Sent home for six weeks? What are they going to do? You know, and so it's a system that continues to send people away again. Reject, 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 reject. Um, go back one more time. I want to say this. Separation. More than half the people who marry and have children are divorced. Those kids are bouncing around. This is not by color. This is American society. Over 100,000 kids in this state alone have one or more or, or two parents incarcerated. They're grieving. They're ashamed and they're frightened. I was, I don't know, someplace. And that particular day, little, uh, these two little girls' mother had gone to the school in the wrong frame of mind and ended up in jail. And these two little girls were terrified, and one of them grabbed me and she says, who's going to take care of us? This is what's going on in the minds of kids. Who's going to take care of me? You know, they don't have any income, they don't have any political power, they don't have any social capital. They depend on big people to take care of them. When they're in school, they depend on the big people at school to be safe, when many of them are not. So how prevalent is the occurrence of trauma? Remember our hero, uh, Attorney General Holt? He went across this country and held um, conferences <coughs> in defense of children, he called. He went all the way across this country. Found out that 60% of the nation's children have experienced trauma or live in an ongoing trauma. 60%. Now, if you look at the scores, uh, you know how we always talk about these competency scores. And 60% um, of Pennsylvania children can't meet. It's a direct reflection. So here are some risk factors. You can look at them. If you're, if you're an educator, a social worker, um, a parent, a, a friend of children, you know, these are things that are good for you to know. Because if you see it, there's a 
baby in here. Uh, the photographer, the camera lady still ran up. I have. Yeah. That baby is not broke. You know, she's not going to miss me. That baby is, what do you think that baby was made for? Somebody give me a guess. What was the baby made for? Great. To love and be loved. We come here to be loved and to love. <laughs> and that baby's getting plenty back here tonight. <laughs> so, so we create these problems by our big people behavior. And you can see some. Go to the next one. Look. Systemic right here. Reverend Lord prayed about this. All of these things. And here. Racism. It says racism. This is a beautiful group. It is a group of all kinds of big people who care about other human beings. Let's go to the next. The cold, okay? I've known kids who didn't know <coughs> them. Years ago, there was a, a, a School called the Downtown Agricultural Industrial School. Anybody here? I'm with you. Okay. And so, toward the end of its time, I went out and set up a counseling program. My graduate training is in pastoral counseling. I'm a teacher of it. <laughs> so, one of the first kids I met had gone home from school one day and the apartment was empty. He sat there three days before his social worker fell. Can you imagine? His mother took one or two siblings and just disappeared. My husband, uh, when he taught at Cheney, he had a student who was living with, he and his sister lived with his aunt. And she took on uh, a portrait. And they went home from school. She told them they couldn't stay anymore because she didn't want to. These traumas occur because big people hurt little people. So, you know, and, and there's even a relationship. And I can attest to some of this. When I was a young mother, uh, we moved 500 miles from where I had been, and I had the kids, and I didn't know what I was doing. And I was doing the best I could to protect them and to train them and so forth. So I, but I sometimes made bad decisions, you know. I was sweet, and uh, this harsh and inconsistent discipline. Parenting is something we are never trained to do. We just sort of do what our parents did, do the best we can. We love them. But sometimes uh, we let something go one time. We'll giggle at something that's inappropriate sometimes. And then we'll chastise the kid for it sometimes. How crazy making is that? You know, what's right and wrong? It's okay today. Funny yesterday, I'm getting spanked today. <laughs> okay. Prioritizing a child's needs. And when we have so many young parents, and they're still in the developmental stage, and they still need, and now they've got a real living human being whose needs are supposed to come first, and they're not really mature enough to do that. <laughs> So, inadequate supervision, I'm sorry. You have to watch your children, because they will make up things to do. And, and a lot of it, you know, will have them in juvie. So each year, about 17.8 million youth are exposed to domestic violence. And then after they see that, they go to school. 
Some people sitting in school afraid their mom will get killed while they're gone. Fifty percent or more children exposed to trauma, and they show uh, difficulties in their affect regulation. Most of you know what that means if you're young and you haven't been in school, you might not know affect, but you're moving. You're moving. Um, their attention and concentration. He's sitting in school, you know, teachers, I'll just say fifth grade, showing you how to do long division, because that's pretty complex. <laughs> when you're 10, 11. And the teacher said, divide, multiply, subtract, bring down. And you're still back on divide. What does that mean? You know? Um, negative self images, impulse control, aggress aggressive uh, behavior and risk taking. Yeah. And so trauma, I told you, is a medical condition. You, these chemicals that are flowing through your brain and um, so, so what it does, it has an impact on cognitive de uh, deficits. Because you can't access your executive function when you're in this condition. And so that impacts long-range planning and decision-making and things such as that. Anxiety impacts the brain. You have a lower memory volume. Um, Stress actually can change your brain. It's hard for kids to focus, it's hard for them to pay attention, it's hard for them to remember, it's hard for them to maintain. And so they're in school and they're not performing well academically. But also because their emotions are out of control and they cannot modulate, they uh, their social interactions are frequently inappropriate. What do you think? Hard to make sense out of what he said. And then here's an adult saying, why did you do that? You know, I told you to so and so. And the kid's just looking at you. Because they never did understand what you told them in the first place. Good stuff. So here are some things these kids are going through. Insomnia, <coughs> startled easily, their hearts are frequently racing. Um, any school nurses in here? Where, where do you think these kids spend as much time as they can? School nurse. Oh, what's your name? What do the kids call them? <laughs> school? Uh-huh. Miss School, I got a stomach ache. What's your name? Ms. Dunsky, my head hurts. Can I go to the nurse? You know, I don't feel good. It's true. They don't feel good. Okay. See here? And here? And here? And here? And sometimes they would draw. Just fold in like a turtle in its shell. And then they can get numb. They're always anxious, they're always frightened. And so they numb down. And numbing down allows them to do things to other people because they don't feel. And so they display in school, they get special ed, as aggressive, uh, Okay. And so they get misread and misdiagnosed because, because they are not assessed for trauma. They are not assessed for trauma. And so here, here's your pipeline. Here's your pipeline. That kid is resistance. He's stubborn. He's confrontational. A lot of kids get diagnosed here and they're not. So, causes unstable and unsafe environment, separation, a serious illness, back to these circles that they use when they assess for trauma at the University of California, Los Angeles. This pretty much reflects their There's a lot of bullying going on. We've spent billions of dollars on bullying 
It's a waste of money. A total waste. You cannot prevent bullying without healing the bully. So these kids are having normal reactions to abnormal events, and this is impacting their performance at school. Now I'm going to skip way down to what we are looking for in policy. There's a whole bunch more in here, but it's Timothy. And I'm not one to abuse the time. <laughs> oh, here, let's look at this first. This is the ACES pyramid. How many of you are familiar with ACES? Okay. And so, when, there's an adver when there are adverse childhood experiences, it disrupts the neural development. And if people go into social, emotional, and cognitive impairments that lead them to adopt health risk behaviors. And diabetes, and heart disease, and, and a number of other things. Can you roll that down? Can, because I want, no, okay. Because what do you think the yellow piece up there at the top? She's Early death. It's death. Early death. And, and we are very familiar with the fact that our children are dying much too young. They are doing things um, that need to die. The gun, the gun shot, the gunning, the gun shooting. We hear about how many people die, but we don't talk about those who live for it. And about $800 million in insurance money every year to society for those who do live. I was in Chester the other day, and I was driving down the street with a person who helps me out. And I saw this very young person walking on a cane who could barely move. And he had gone as, because everybody I know in Chester knows nearly everybody in Chester. And because it's, it's a mile and a half by a mile and a half. And so um, I said to this person, I said, was that child shot? And he said, yes. He's he, this is his recovery from the gunshot wound. That child will live his whole life. Um, debilitated. Now, a system where they are understood and where there are uh, interventions and where they are put in a path of healing and not of punishment, where they're not put in the pipeline, because you're really fighting an uphill battle. I have had children and whose parents were incarcerated. Yes. Um, there is a lot of programs that they identify, they identify that in Pennsylvania, that we like one of the leads in terms of connecting children with incarcerated families, and it's really working. And the outcome is pretty great. The um, Inside Out program is out of Temple, and it's in the state of Pennsylvania, and it's making a difference uh, in terms of link linking them children with a mother or father that may be incarcerated or a caregiver. So if they do visitation, they work with them, they, they meet their needs in the schools and outside the school as a whole. It's a holistic approach. So I can talk to you afterwards. But that is being addressed because of the work Dr. Flint been doing. You know, the room is pretty crowded, and it's like sexy now to talk about true justice and to reform. So, you know, this room is packed. You know, you talked about 20 years ago when she started this thing 12 years ago. Nobody, everybody was ducking and hiding. But now we see it, and we may be getting a chance to win this thing. Yeah. Because now they want to take the money out of incarceration and put in rehab because of the drug epidemic oh, yeah. now. So maybe now they'll use some of that money instead of putting it in prisons and put it back in education also. So 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 we can probably get this type of work implemented like Boston, you know, that, that was a front runner because they had legislators that were willing to get on the line and fight for a change. That's why they more proactive. But with people in this room Listen to this, doing what you got to do. We on a victory. You know what I mean? We win in, in, in justice reform. We just brought home 300 
to form a juvenile life. Yes. Today, where a kid was given 155 years, they reversed that and said nice. that's wrong. Yes. So yes. right now we're in a climate where if we stick together yes. and we do the leg work, yes. we can change education, yes. we can change health, yes. we can keep our kids out of the pipeline. Yes. Right? Yes. We have to keep organizing. Different, different issues and concerns. I'm finding so many different mentalities today. It seems hard. It seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is we can't create that we walk on everything else. is a challenge. 